And I'm going to sort of keep that. Good morning, or good afternoon, I guess. This is Tina Pettengill from the Maine Public Health Association. Thanks for joining to, for our first webinar in the series titled Childhood Exposure to Marketing in Schools, Changing the Scene. Uh, we're really excited to bring you this webinar today. We have two fabulous presenters um, who are going to walk us through a really exciting project um, in Cumberland County that impacts the entire state and gives us a lot of data and information in which to work from. Um, just a couple of logistical items before we get started. The first of which is you guys, if you, you haven't noticed already, you're muted. So anyone on the line listening is going to be muted throughout the entire webinar. You can, though, that doesn't preclude you from answering or asking any questions. Just go into your chat box and you can type a question out to just one of the just the presenters, to the facilitators. You can even chat to other people um, on the webinar. But we'll be monitoring the chat box throughout the webinar to ensure that we answer all of those questions. We will, however, not answer the questions until the very end of the speaking portion. Um, so after our speakers have gone through their slides and presented the information, we will then read out any questions that have been entered into the chat box. So you can ask your questions throughout, but we will hold them and answer them at the very end. The other thing we'll do at the end is we will unmute participants that want to ask a question. So there's a place for you to raise your hand and you can do that and we will also unmute you and you can ask a question that way. So hopefully we'll give everyone uh, ample opportunity to ask and uh, get questions answered. Like I said, I'm really excited about our webinar today. Obesity is something that the Maine Public Health Association focuses on. It's our number two cause of uh, leading cause of preventable disease and death in Maine and in the United States. Um, quickly creeping up on tobacco. Um, and two folks who have been working on obesity policy for over 10 years have agreed to join us today and provide us with some really important and uh, timely information around ex uh, childhood exposure to marketing in schools. And that's Michelle Polachek and Karen O'Rourke from the University of New England. Like I said, both of these women have been working on obesity policy for over 10 years. Uh, Michelle is an, the, an associate professor of public health at the University of New England, and Karen is the associate director of the School of Community and Population Health at, at, at the University of New England. So I really want to thank Michelle and Karen um, for joining us today. I'm going to unmute them, and I'm going to let them take over. And uh, as a, just another reminder, you can put any questions you have in the chat box at any time um, throughout the webinar, and we will answer them at the end. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and unmute Michelle and Karen and uh, let them take over. Okay, thank you, Tina. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great. Great, great. Well, thank you, and thanks for this opportunity for us to be able to highlight our work. So this is Michelle, and um, I'm going to do part one of um, Childhood Exposure to Marketing in Schools, How to Change the Scene. And our research was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation under two Healthy Eating Research Program grants, round four and round eight. So next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to start with just a bit of background about why we should care about food and beverage marketing at school, present some very brief findings from our 2010 school marketing study and then lead, that will lead right into um, what really is the focus of this presentation um, for my part, which is the current study, Process and Findings. Next slide. So nearly $2 billion a year are directed at youth um, in terms of food uh, marketing expenditures. Um, and 90% of that is for unhealthy food that's high in sugar, fat, and sodium. Next slide. And in terms of marketing at school, um, 48 national uh, food and beverage companies spent $149 million on in-school 
youth-directed marketing in 2012, and there's no reason to believe that that number or that percent um, of total marketing would have gone down since 2012. If anything, it, it would have gone up. Um, and that um, marketing comprises, 93% of that is for um, carbonated beverages, juice, and other beverages. So that's the vast majority of the in-school directed youth marketing. Um, that estimate is, is, is definitely an underestimate because it doesn't include local quick service franchises, which are selling products and advertising in schools. It does not include sponsored educational materials. And it definitely does not include digital marketing um, to kids while in school or on school issued devices, which we know industry has been um, increasing their spending on um, recently. Next slide. So why should we care about um, school-based marketing? Well, for one, we know it works. Um, and otherwise the industry would not be spending money in this area. It conflicts with values and the purpose of education. It reinforces marketing outside of school, which threatens health. And the reason it threatens health is because much of the school-based advertising is for unhealthy foods, just as the advertising out, outside of school is. It increases health disparities because uh, there are marketing disparities, um, uh, population, minority populations and uh, populations of color, for example, are marketed to um, more with more unhealthy um, products. It increases health, dis uh, excuse me, it decreases um, self-esteem by um, promoting consumer culture and personal insecurity. It um, threatens values through the market values versus civic values that are promoted through marketing. Um, it affects body image, um, again, um, fostering insecurity through and, um, and it also um, threatens learning processes. It discourages critical thinking and um, promotes behavioral problems because of the manipulation inherent in marketing. And it also, it also threatens personal development with its focus on material goods versus creative pursuits and healthy relationships. So I bring all this up because these are evidence-based threats um, that are, um, that are uh, you know, talked about in a yearly report on school commercialism that comes out from the National Education Policy Center. And all of this for very little revenue. Um, schools get 0.002 to 0.03 percent of their school budget from school-based marketing. Next slide. So our first study, I just briefly cover what we found. Um, no statewide um, uh, no statewide survey of marketing in schools had taken place really before 2010. So we set out to explore the nature and extent of school-based marketing in 20 randomly selected high schools in Maine. And we also set out to assess compliance with a statewide, statewide school marketing ban, which was in place at the time, the Foods of Minimal Nutritional Value Ban. Next slide. And um, this is just a picture of product marketing, obviously marketing on the product themselves. Just, I'm just showing you a couple pictures of the types of marketing that we looked at in schools. Next slide. This is um, direct marketing, which is marketing on posters and signs, either on walls or on vending, for example. <laughs> Next slide. And this is indirect marketing, which is marketing in conjunction with other products or services. Um, in this case, pull and spring on a cup. Next slide. And I'll just jump right to what we found, which is um, you can see here the 10 most frequently marketed products on posters and signs and vending. And in red, I have the products that were not compliant with the Foods of Minimal Nutritional Value Standards. And um, so you can see that Coke and Pepsi um, comprise the most frequently not compliant products that were marketed and, and also comprise 45% of all the marketing found, all, all the not compliant marketing found. Next slide. 
And most of that non-compliant marketing was found in athletic areas, teachers' lounges, and cafeterias with an average of 12.1 instances of not compliant marketing per school. Next slide. Also, we found a lot of um, not compliant marketing on scoreboards. And here you can see um, that, again, Coke and Pepsi came up with were the top uh, most not compliant marketed on scoreboards. Next slide. Schools told us that they really wanted more resources to help implement the law. 70% wanted more information about um, the law, including what is banned, and more than half wanted technical assistance on how to implement the law better. Next slide. So this, all this information really led us to apply for another study, which would allow us to assess marketing compliance with a new federal standard that was put in place um, for the sales of competitive foods under the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. And we also wanted to see what kinds of resources it would take to get marketing that was not compliant from, uh, it, for, uh, with a new law out of schools. So um, we wanted to provide technical assistance to schools, engage in a marketing improvement process, assessing the resources required. And then we also set out to explore forms of digital marketing exposure, but I won't be covering that aspect of the grant today. Next slide. So now I'm going to show you what we found um, in terms of the baseline in the new study. And remember, this is just three schools. Thank you. Three schools um, in Portland. And um, overall, so you'll see here spring 2014 and fall 2014. Our funder wanted us to, to, to do two baseline assessments in case schools were gearing up for the new um, smart snack standards and were making changes in their marketing based on that, just in case. So we didn't find much here. So you can see that all marketing in blue and um, not compliant marketing with the smart snacks, which is this new federal standard for um, sales in schools, which I guess I should explain that this is, a this is a new federal standard for sales, but the marketing standard would most likely be based on the sales standard. The marketing standard still has not been finalized. Next slide. So breaking those numbers down a little bit, I'll show you the marketing in the high school, middle school, and elementary school that we worked with. In light blue, you see the instances um, of marketing on posters and signs. The dark blue is the instances of marketing on vending. And then the different shades of the red are instances of uh, not compliant marketing. And you'll see that in the spring and in the fall of 2014, there really wasn't a huge difference in terms of the not compliant marketing that we found. Uh, in terms of baseline. Next slide. All right. In the middle school, very kind of similar uh, numbers in terms of the not compliant marketing um, in both baseline periods. Next slide. And very little um, not compliant marketing was found in the elementary school. Um, just one instance in the spring and two instances in the fall. Next slide. So the 10 most frequent products marketed in school in 2014, um, in terms of the not compliant products, were Snapple, Arnold Palmer, and Coke. And um, of course, those are um, sugar, sugary beverages. Um, and you can see that those are uh, 28, 6, and 6 in terms of the instances. Next slide. OK, we also looked at um, city-owned venues. Because um, in, at, at the Portland High School, city-owned venues are used for, um, for most of the sports, both practices and games. So the Hadlock Field is used for baseball. The Portland Expo is used for basketball. The Ice Arena is used for ice hockey. And at Fitzpatrick Stadium, soccer, lacrosse, football, and track um, practices and games are held. Next slide. So overall, in terms of instances of marketing in school versus city-owned athletic facilities, you can see here that um, school-owned athletic facilities have much less marketing overall, but also the percentage of um, not compliant marketing compared to compliant marketing is much lower than 
in the city-owned athletic areas. Um, next slide, and I'm going to break this out for you. So this is the outside of Hadlock Field, and um, this Coca-Cola sign welcomes you in. And then the next slide, please. You can see, and, and I know this is a, not a very good um, quality photograph, but you sort of get the picture that there's nothing but really marketing everywhere you look. Next slide. And we often see, um, well, and this is a picture from Hadlock Field. This is marketing for um, alcoholic beverages as well. Next slide. So at Hadlock Field, 56 instances of marketing were found, 43 of them not compliant, a total of 77% of the marketing not compliant with the Smart Snack standards. Next slide. This is the outside of the expo. Next slide. And typical of what you see on the walls in, inside the expo. Next slide. And 48 instances of marketing, 80% um, or 38 instances not compliant with the standards. Next slide. And the ice arena, similar. Next slide. Um, 26 instances of marketing, 11 not, or 42% not compliant with the standard. Next slide. Oh, and, and Fitzpatrick Stadium, um, which is pretty much exclusively used by um, youth. I believe. Um, next slide. Two instances of marketing and both of those not compliant with the standard. Next slide. <clears throat> so in terms of the 10 most frequent products marketed in city-owned venues, you can see that Coke and Pepsi also top the list here. And then we have a whole host of alcoholic beverages um, which follow. Next slide. So. Once we had our baseline assessment, we began our school improvement process. And um, we paid for half of a school health coordinator's time to be able to work with the school health coordinator. And um, my co-conspirator, Elizabeth Pratt, is here um, to help answer some questions later. And I'll have her talk about um, a couple pieces in a bit. Um, so she met with each principal and worked with or restarted wellness teams that um, either existed or had kind of um, stopped meeting regularly at some of the schools to create an improvement plan for each school. And we tracked and documented each change and the cost required and the resources required to do that. Next slide. And this is an example. I know that there's a lot on this slide. And I just want to give you examples of um, kind of what we did. So I'll let her talk about this. But for example, here we have um, we had some storage boxes um, in each of the, um, in the school that we, that we um, worked with. And um, we wrote, we, we tracked the, the instance of marketing, the location, removal options. We took pictures whenever we could, um, talked about the resources, and then talked a little bit about the process. So I'll let her explain a little bit about what happened. Sure, um, I can. School. Sure, this is Elizabeth, and I can just give a quick highlight from each of the schools that we worked with. Um, this was an elementary school, and I think the first step in working with this school was to find a liaison or a champion from the school to help uh, do some of this assessment work and then do the improvement plan. And in this case, um, I worked a lot with the assistant principal and the librarian, and they were really wonderful to work with. And helped me in terms of looking through the school and finding the non-compliant marketing. And it was sort of a surprise in this case where we found that there was a lot of unintentional marketing from the food pantry boxes because they, a lot of teachers didn't have um, places to store extra materials in their classrooms. And so there were all these boxes available for free uh, once the food was consumed. And so we did find quite a few boxes that had the marketing on them. So our, our solution was to purchase clear bins for them, and a lot of them were able to replace those boxes with the bins. Perfect. Um, next, oh, next, next slide. slide. So in this case, it was a middle school. And again, the first step was to find champions to work with. And we worked with a, a really strong wellness team um, that met regularly, and then also worked with the athletic director, um, who was 
very helpful. He was a PE teacher and athletic director at the middle school and the school custodian. And they were all um, very helpful in terms of um, addressing really two types of marketing. One of them was on the vending machines. And we worked with J uh, Jason CV from National Beverage. And he really, with no hesitation, um, had the panels redesigned and changed so they were compliant. So that went very, very well. Um, very, it was very smooth. And then the, um, the other thing that we did was there was a Coca-Cola sign in the gym. And we worked um, first with Jason CV to talk about replacing the Coca-Cola with water um, advertising. But then because the principal and athletic director didn't really want to do any marketing, um, we came up with a creative strategy to put um, uh, the math school mascot on the panels instead. So that was a great result. You can do the next slide. And then this one is the high school. Um, and we had actually a pretty um, easy process here in working with the principal. She was really great to work with. And we identified some signage in the cafeteria with non-compliant marketing on some homemade recycling signs, um, which were creative, great signs, but they didn't have the appropriate um, um, examples of products to be recycled. So the um, principal worked with us to switch those out so that they were compliant. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So this slide shows um, the marketing changes, instances at baseline to post. And this is instances of not compliant marketing. So um, just to show you, in the, um, East, in the uh, elementary school that we worked with, there were very few to begin with. And there were just a couple also at post. And then both in the middle school and the high school, we also we drastically reduced the number of um, instances of not compliant marketing, but we didn't com we weren't able to completely um, remove those. And, and that was likely because both of these schools had um, uh, pantry storage boxes, at, at least likely pantry storage boxes that made their way into the classrooms with um, marketing on the outside of those boxes. Next slide. So in terms of the resources that were needed to get this marketing out of schools, the school health coordinator was by far the biggest cost. Having someone there to actually um, check on the work, liaison with the wellness team, the um, principal, or whoever the, the contact was in the school was really the most important piece and the biggest cost. Um, the distributor, National Beverage, replaced non-compliant vending panels, panels for free. Um, and the rep was really easy to work with. Um, Coca-Cola signs in the um, gym in the middle school were replaced, as Elizabeth said, by sticky decals of their school mascot, the Falcon, for around $100. And this worked really well because they liked the idea of having that sort of school pride um, decal um, of the Falcon in the, in the gym versus the marketing. And, um, the so Portland High School recycling signs were replaced by the recycling club at no cost. Next slide. So the key challenges or lessons learned. Um, we, it was definitely a challenge for Elizabeth to contact school personnel at first. But once she was able to create those relationships, um, it got easier. Um, the athletic directors. Um, pretty much owned the gyms, and that relationship was really key. It was really important in the middle school to be able to change that that falcon out for the uh, Coca-Cola. Kind of figuring out what will motivate change in schools. Again, the school pride piece in the middle school was really easy. Just knowing, knowing what um, school administrators are interested in and what will motivate them to make changes is an important piece of this. Uh, food pantry boxes made, that made their way into the classrooms were a challenge. And, um, and another lesson is that much of the marketing we found was not school commercialism, per se. Schools weren't really paid to have the marketing. They're just kind of marketing that made their way, made its way into the classroom. And so this is going to take vigilance um, on someone's part to, to, um, to track all of this. And then the city-owned venues is a major gap. Next slide. <coughs> 
So um, in terms of implications for policy, I think we need um, a mechanism and assessment, um, somebody's role and paid time to, um, to track, monitor, and make sure that um, marketing that's not allowed stays out of schools. Um, wellness policies can help to address um, food, the food pantry issue, this non-commercial marketing that we found in schools, and we also need to find ways to address the marketing in city-owned venues. And that's the end of my of part one of my presentation, and I'm going to let Karen take over. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and thanks, Tina, for having us and everyone who, um, who's participated. So this really, um, fall, these flow really nicely, these two presentations, because what I'm going to be talking about really um, happened really at the same time as Michelle and um, Lizeth were working on theirs. Um, and this is a project of the Cumberland District Public Health Council to eliminate soda scoreboards in public schools. So just what I hope that by the end, of, oops, can you go back one more? That I hope that at the end of this that you'll back one more. Yeah, thank you. Um, at the end of this, um, what I want to do is explain the process that we went through um, to eliminate the junk food on the scoreboards, and then really talk about the partnerships and roles, because I think this is something that everybody on the call could probably um, take and um, move forward. So next slide, please. So Michelle um, talked a lot about the role marketing plays in childhood obesity. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but I just want to say that I really like this particular quote because I think it really nicely summarizes the issue and why it's important. And that is that unhealthy marketing is pervasive and often targets young children, leading them to nag their caregivers until they buy unhealthy foods. Over time, these kids can develop a preference for foods that are bad for them, a preference that can last a lifetime. So that's why that's um, an important thing to do. Oops, next slide. <laughs> Karen, I just, wanna, I just wanted to apologize. I'm not doing that. Some some evil forces have taken over for a moment. But No, the, this happened to this. This happened when I do it, too. So, yeah, I know, <laughs> evil forces. So, um, go to the next slide, then, please, Tina. So, um, getting um, scoreboards in public schools that are free of sugar sweetened beverages um, advertising is actually, in Cumberland, is actually a process that started about 10 years ago. In 2007, um, after the recommendations from the Commission to Study Public Health that focused on obesity policy, um, a bill was passed that prohibited soda advertising on scoreboards, <clears throat> and Michelle discussed that a little bit. So that state law did result in the removal of some of the sugar-sweetened um, beverage scoreboards in Cumberland County. Um, but then you heard from Michelle that research they did in 2010 and 11, we found that some of that was that the implementation was weak. And it really took what we did um, with our partners in 2014-15, um, just this year, really took us to the next step that we really needed to get to the final result. And so here we are. Um, so this is, we see, this is what um, things look like in Cumberland County right now. Um, they look pretty good, but you can see uh, in 2014 where we started, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this is um, what we started with. And as you can see, and these aren't all the scoreboards that we found, but it looks really, really different. OK, so the next slide. Um, so the project was completed under the umbrella of our Cumberland Public Health um, Council. Um, our Cumberland District Public Health Council. And because some people on the webinar may not be familiar with this structure, I just want to briefly explain that um, because Maine doesn't have these county health departments, what we do have is nine district coordinating councils made up of volunteer stakeholders. So in our Cumberland District Public Health Council has a mission to promote health by providing information, uh, coordination, and advocacy. So that's, um, that is the umbrella for this project. So the next slide, please. So in 2013, the Cumberland District Public Health Council identified obesity as one of its priority areas. So we established a work group with this charge, which was to identify opportunities that exist within the district, which is Cumberland County, to impact obesity, and then take action on one or more of those opportunities. OK, so the next slide. So um, here we put together our work group. So it included um, Bethany Sanborn um, from the Public Health Division, uh, Public Health Division, who was the co-chair along with me. <clears throat> we had Kathy Savoy from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, um, Ashley Emmonson from um, the Let's Go person from Opportunity Alliance, 
<laughs> go back again, Ann Lang from Healthy Casco Bay, Kristen Dell from Healthy Portland, and then myself. So this is the, um, the core group that uh, worked on this project. <clears throat> so the next slide. Um, okay, so the work group met to determine what we would do and when we would do it. Um, so because there were already a lot of groups that were working on different aspects of obesity prevention, we started with a scan of what was currently um, being done, and then we identified the gaps. We reviewed CDC's list of best practices for obesity prevention, and then we looked at available research, including the study in Maine um, that Michelle Polachek had done um, to see you know, the results of that. And what we needed to do was select a project that could be completed in one or two years, and this is the important part that would not require funding. There was no funds to do this work. So everything that you see that we did, we did without any funding, just the time of the work group members. So, uh, you know, I think that Michelle Polachek um, talked about that project and had a grant, which is great because now we're going to use that information again, but our project had no funding um, to do it, which is why everybody on the phone could probably do some of it. Okay, so the next slide. So Michelle's study, as she talked about, um, that we looked at this, and, and there's a lot of findings from this study, but this one really jumped out at us, that 63% of schools had scoreboards that were not compliant with Maine's school marketing law. So, um, and then next slide. So that seemed like a doable challenge to this group, so we set out the goal, which was to make all Cumberland County schools scoreboards free of soda ads. So that was our goal. So the next slide, please. So as we embarked on this project, we had two tools that helped us do that. Um, first was there a state law. So this is a law that was passed in 2007. It was called an Act to Protect Children's Health on School Grounds. Um, it was LD 184, now called Chapter 156. And it had two parts to it. One related to tobacco use on school grounds, and this was the other part, which basically said, Brand-specific advertising of food or beverages is prohibited in school buildings or on school grounds except for food and beverages meeting standards for sale or distribution on school grounds. So I'm not going to explain all of that, but basically what it says is that if you couldn't sell it, you couldn't advertise it. And even back in 2007, um, soda was not allowed to be sold um, except it, with a couple of exceptions like in teachers' rooms. Um, so if you can go back one more. Um, so this is the, uh, I just wanted to show this reference. This is the um, study that was done, Michelle Polachek's study in 2010, and this is the reference, and she already talked about the aim and the funding, so this is where it is. If you go to the next slide, and she also showed you um, this particular thing, which was also good for our group to have, because we, we saw what it was that we were expecting to see on scoreboard. So you could saw that Coke and Pepsi and Mountain Dew were the one, two, and three um, most often products sold that did not, um, were not compliant with the state law. You can stay right there, Tina. Um, and so, and this was the other finding that was really important to the project um, because it told us that we needed to present ourselves to schools in a way that showed that we were providing assistance and resources. <clears throat> and we were not there to be punitive because um, one of the findings, the other finding of the uh, research was that school administrators feel that banning um, food and beverage marketing in schools is important, but they needed more information, technical assistance, and resources to help make it happen. And these slides keep jumping all over. My apologies, everybody. This is fine to stay where you are, Chief. Yeah. Um, so we compiled, this is a process that we went through. So we compiled a list of all the schools. So we were looking at 12 school districts. Um, so we didn't include Portland because of the project that was going on there. So the other 12 districts in the, in the county. And that included 67 schools. We also did not go to the Island Elementary Schools because, if you remember, we didn't have any money to go out there. <clears throat> so um, we also knew that there would be a cost to replace the scoreboards, so we need an additional partner. And um, so for many years, the Beverage Association said they'd be willing to replace scoreboards that had soda on them, so we contacted the Maine Beverage Association and asked them if they'd be willing to partner with us on this project and to replace any signs that we found that did not comply with the state law. And they agreed. So then the work group, <laughs> can you go back one more? Thanks. The work, uh, back two more now. Yeah, thank you. So the work group, what we did is that we went out and visited each of the schools to check the scoreboard. So it's really important that you actually go out and see the schools. 
um, because the schools, if you call them, they really won't know whether or not some of their scoreboards have soda on them. We looked at all the fields and all the gyms. So in high school, that could be anywhere from four to six fields, plus the gym, maybe a pool. Middle schools have three or four fields, plus the gym. And then elementary schools, it was pretty much just the gym that we looked at. OK, so the next slide. So what did we find? Um, so we found that eight of our 12 school districts, or 67%, had at least one sugary drink branded scoreboard. And it wasn't any one particular field. It was all over the place. It was um, the football field, track field, baseball and softball fields, multi-purpose field, soccer field, the gym. So, And the ads were Mountain Dew, Coke, and Pepsi, um, as we saw from the research. <clears throat> OK, next slide, please. So the person to contact in a school about anything related to athletic venues is the athletic director. It's not the principal. It's not the superintendent. Um, so we sent a letter to each athletic director <clears throat> and explained what the Cumberland District Public Health Council was and what we were trying to accomplish. We referenced the law, and we provided them a copy of the law, uh, along with a copy of a fact sheet that was done for us by Change Lab Solutions called Understanding the Law, which just kind of breaks that down a little bit. We explained the role of the Maine Beverage Association in switching out the soda ad for a water ad and let them know there'd be no charge for that. And then we sent a copy to the superintendent. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so this um, slide just shows you what we gave to the Beverage Association. So everything in yellow is what we provided to the Beverage Association. So it included the school district name, the athletic director. We just have um, initials here, but we gave the actual athletic director's names, the athletic director's phone number, what the current logo was, because they needed to know whether to replace it with a Dasani or an Aquafina, <clears throat> and then the actual location of that particular field, um, and then um, so that they could um, figure out what it was um, could, that could be fit right over the sugar sweet beverage logo. So next slide. <clears throat> so then the beverage association. He um, actually went and either contacted or visited each of the schools to find out the size of the sign. And then he ordered the signs and had them delivered directly to each of the schools. And then it was up to the schools then to have their facilities personnel replace it. So as you can see in this photograph right here, the Freeport sign, is that that was a uh, Pepsi logo right under that Dasani. And they just went in and screwed that sign right onto over the um, Pepsi sign. And some of them were. Um, were you know different kinds of things, but they're really easy to. It was really relatively easy to replace. Okay, next slide, slide please. Um, so then the committee rechecked um, several months later, and of course we found out there are several of the schools that still had not um, switched out their scoreboard. So we recontacted all the athletic directors. I think there was two or three. Um, and reminded them to send them out. Some of them just forgot, and some of them said, oh, yeah, I just did it yesterday. So, <clears throat> And so most of the schools now have made the transition. We've, we did find out that there is one problem. One of the signs is the wrong size, so that has to be reordered. But four signs were taken down and not replaced with any advertisement, which is actually ideal, I think. Seven scoreboards have, um, now have water products on it. OK, next slide. Um, um, so once again, you know, the partners, this is a group that did it, and we have to add the local school districts and um, New Auger from the Maine Beverage Association, because this is the partnership that really um, helped make this happen. Um, if you go to the next slide. So some thoughts on partnerships. So you really need partners if you're going to do it countywide, and I think any SCC or any county group could do this. We had 67 schools. Um, with athletic fields all over the place. So it really helps if you have partners who actually know where the schools are and know where the athletic fields are, because some of those athletic fields are quite hidden. Um, so and, our, and then secondly, our relationship with the Maine Beverage Association, we made very clear from the beginning that we're going to partner on this particular project, but acknowledge that we could be on different sides in the future. You know, And in fact, we did have a pretty um, contentious legislative session where we were on the opposite sides, but we kind of put that aside for this particular pro um, project. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so the Beverage Association was critical to cover the cost of the replacement, and we do really appreciate that they did that for us. Um, I think the umbrella of the Public Health Council was really helpful. Um, I think it added some credibility to the project. It wasn't one organization going after them. It was sort of this group of organizations asking them to do something to improve the health of their community. And so I think that was great. And also, schools are great partners, but it really needs to be easy for them to participate. And I think we did 
really make it as easy as, we po as possible. So summary of lessons learned, having a state law is critical to the success, but you just can't assume that the law is being implemented. And knowing that there was a lack of statewide compliance with the law, that being able to have that research really was an important piece of evidence in determining local programming. And in fact, the work that they've done right now is, um, you'll see, we'll be using it again in the future. Go to the next slide. Um, so without any funding, which we didn't have, so it takes partners who are willing to just go to every school to examine the scoreboards, to revisit and recontact schools when needed, and to fund the sign replacement if sign removal is not an option. And, so, and also, um, although it's not a priority for schools, they are willing to participate, as I said, if it's made easy for them. So once again, this is where we started, which doesn't look very good. And if you go to the next slide, that's where we are right now. And given that there's thousands of students, their family members, and community members that see these scoreboards every year, I do think this adds greatly to creating a healthier community um, for those of us in Cumberland County. So our next project is that we're going to go look at those um, city-owned venues that are covered by the school law um, and see what we can do to get those replaced. Um, we will be looking at some of those city venues that uh, Michelle just talked about in the city of Portland. Um, we have some of those I and um, and also we're going to look at some of the um, private uh, private school too that aren't covered by the law and see if we can get some support from them. Um, so that's our next project um, and um, I think that the group um, we met yesterday we have a strategy and hopefully in a year we'll see some of these other um, uh, um, some of these other venues where mostly kids um, use um, see some of those changed. And once again, just like to acknowledge I'm Bethany Sanborn as the co-chair, um, the rest of the members of our Cumberland District OBC work group, and um, many of those slides were Michelle Polachek's slides, so we want to thank her for that. And please contact me if anybody wants any information. We're happy to share our letter to the athletic directors, um, information on contacting Newell Auger, um, anything that you would want, we'd be happy to um, share that information with you. So I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karen and Michelle. That was great. Um, I want to apologize for the slides advancing on their own. Um, <laughs> I, I think we somehow got them set on auto advance, and there was nothing I could do in the middle of that. So I apologize for that. But hopefully everyone was able to keep up. And we have, we have one chat question um, uh, already from someone, so I'm going to go ahead and read that um, so we can maybe have some discussion here. Oops, I just pulled out the wrong one. Huh. Uh, where is my there we go. Um, the question is, oh, here we go. Um, did replacing the Coca-Cola signs with the Falcon cost anything to the district? Sometimes these signs are sponsored by the companies with an agreement, uh, in an agreement with the district that spans a few years. Well, I'll start us, and if Elizabeth has, this is Michelle, if Elizabeth has something to add, um, she can. Um, no, it, it, in terms of the, um, the contract, there was nothing, all the contracts had run out in terms of um, needing to display the Coca-Cola signs. That, I mean, given that there's a state law that prohibits that kind of signage for non-compliant um, Products, I believe that that would supersede any kind of contract that even might be in place with the school. So um, it just cost us the hundred dollars um, for um, to to buy the decals. We went to Staples or somewhere fast signs, fast signs and just got um, magnetic. Actually, uh, actually no, we started with the idea. The custodian had the idea of, of doing magnets um, because to make metal panels to screw into the metal, it would have been too costly. And then the magnets, um, the custodian tested the metal and magnets didn't stick to it. And then we were worried that a ball might hit the magnet and it would fall. So he came up with the idea of the stickers. And that ended up being the cheapest solution as well. So that came out of grant funds. So we had money from Robert Wood Johnson to cover um, marketing removal, and we were tracking that. So that was about $100. Hope that answers your question. Now, I, this is Karen. I just think there's a ton of schools out there who have um, 
because we didn't cut, nobody said to us, oh, we have a contract, you know, mm -hmm. that that's an issue. So I don't think there's a lot of schools that do that anymore. I think they used to, but I don't think they do that a lot anymore. Anything else, Tina? Yes, I'm seeing another question. Hold on, please. We had a question. Were students involved in any of the research or outreach efforts? Um, so this is Michelle again. Yes, we, um, we offered to include students in our assessment um, procedures and our school improvement processes. And some schools took us off on, took us, excuse me, took us up on that and others didn't so much. But at the middle school, I had um, in both baseline assessments in the, both the spring and the fall of 2014, we had the same three students walk around with us and do that. And they were um, middle school students and they really enjoyed that. And it was really helpful to have them um, to help us, you know, understand like all the nooks and crannies of the school. And, and they were also supposed to then participate in the improvement process, but that didn't quite go as expected. I don't believe there was a student representative on the wellness team. There, sometimes, oh, sometimes um, there was. yeah, sometimes students came to the wellness team meetings and we had um, some plans to work with art students to redesign oh, yeah. the signage in the high school, yeah. but that proved challenging in terms of the staff time. Um, that was the biggest barrier and I think the principal was really protective of her staff, you know, and their time and the students' time, so we weren't able to do that. I, I would just like to add um, that I think getting students involved in this is the perfect solution. And actually, at the high school, I offered to do an internship with high school students who needed, because they do they have um, like a senior internship that they can do. Mm -hmm. And um, the person who directed that was very interested. I made a one-page flyer, put it up on the walls, they advertised it, and we got no takers. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, but I, I do think it's a wonderful way to um, to involve students in the policy change pro process. I have um, and one more question, and that is about evaluation. Uh, you did a lot of great pre and post assessment uh, ga data gathering. Was there any evaluation done on the effectiveness of the project or, or the health impact? So in terms of effectiveness, we just we looked at the environment. So we really just looked at the marketing, pre and post our intervention. In terms of effectiveness, like uh, effectiveness on health, um, the scope of our study would not have been able to prove that and we didn't really have the resources to look at this over time. It would take a lot of time to do that and, and we know that marketing, you know, others have done studies on marketing's effectiveness in terms of getting people to buy the things that are being marketed. We know that that's true and we also can make the connection between what people are buying and eating and health. So we didn't need to do that in this study. We know that removing marketing is going to positively contribute to a person's health because those connections have been made in larger studies that are experimental and people have spent a lot more money on than us. So then we, what we had available to us and what we were able to do, we, we only worked in these three schools in the second study and um, in terms of the marketing removal. That's wonderful. Um, were there any other questions from, from folks? You can put your hand up um, and I can unmute you or you can um, uh, write a question in the question box. Um, you do know how to get a hold of Karen and Michelle. Well, at least, at least Karen. <laughs> Karen's email is up there. Um, she she sits near Michelle, so you guys can um, ask questions of them anytime. You can also feel free to ask um, me questions, and I can I can um, pass those on. Um, the if no one else has any other questions, I'm going to move on to the fact that we have another great webinar coming up um, this Monday, the 14th at 10 a.m. regarding telehealth and public health and how um, this has a huge opportunity to improve access for rural populations in Maine. 
Thank you all so much again for, for joining us and of course um, mostly to Michelle and Karen for not only doing this great project but providing the information um, and analyzing it and providing it to us in this manner. Uh, and also just a, another shout out to both of these women because they have been, they re remain involved in obesity policy efforts um, not on, not just limited to marketing in schools, but other um, policy efforts as well. And they have been instrumental to MPHA's efforts at the state house and beyond. So we, um, I think they know how much I appreciate their efforts. But I just wanted to to say it publicly, um, how what a great resource they are to all of us around the state. So thank you guys again, and thank you all for joining. I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, Tina. Thank you.